Welcome to the Contractor Success Forum. Today, we are discussing three contract terms to get paid faster. And who do we have with us today on this very special day? We have Alex Barthet with the Lean Zone Construction Law blog. And we have our regular crew, Stephen Brown, McDaniel Whitley, Bonding and Insurance Agency. And in the other corner, we have Wade Carpenter, Carpenter and Company CPAs. And I am Rob Williams with Iron Gate Entrepreneurial Support Systems. Alex, tell us about you and your company and your podcast and how you got in this business of construction and lean laws and all this great stuff. Sure. Thanks. Thanks for having me, guys. I appreciate it. I've been listening to your podcast for a while and I said, you know what, let me reach out to these guys who seem to know what they got going on about construction and helping contractors, which is what we do on the Lean Zone podcast. So I'm a board certified construction attorney here in South Florida. I was a mechanical engineer and then decided to go over to the dark side, as some of my clients tell me, and become a lawyer. And I work with my father and we have 12 lawyers that work with us. And all we do is construction law. We help those folks in the trade with their contracts, help them get paid, deal with liens and bonds and construction defects. That's what we do every day. I was just thinking about that. All four of us are second generation somewhere in the thing, you know, Wade and I, we all have dads and then Steven's got a relative in the business. That's interesting. We're all second generation, at least second. Yeah. Makes it That's easier. That's true. I, it may be easier. I mean, it is as far as getting advice. It seems correct to me that my job seems to be getting a little bit easier as I have a few years on me. But I think the most interesting thing to me that I want to ask Alex is, how did your engineering degree help you in working with contractors? It gives you a level of understanding of construction that most lawyers don't have when you have a engineering or construction management degree before you went to law school. When I went to law school, I think it was me and maybe one other person that had a science or engineering degree. Most everyone had a poli-sci degree, uh, an English degree. So yeah, it was unusual. I thought I wanted to be a patent attorney first. So I actually studied and took the patent bar and then started doing that and realized, well, geez, this is incredibly boring. So I decided, you know, let me try this construction thing. We always had construction clients when I started working with my father almost 25 years ago, but more and more it's just grown. And now it's all we do. We don't do anything else. It's just construction. Yeah, there's nothing boring about construction law, I imagine. Correct. Always exciting. And they're great clients. Boring about taxes they're either. great clients. We talked about some topics that our mutual listeners need to know. And Alex, we're just, we're grateful to have you on our podcast because we always say that your financial board of directors should include your construction-oriented CPA, construction business advisor like Rob, banker, lawyer, and a bonding and insurance agent like me. So... Thank you. No, you're very welcome. I, and I agree. I can tell you, having done this for a long time, our most successful clients have all of those folks in their corner, all focused on construction. Those are the clients that are doing the best because they have a group of people around them that understand the industry, especially the local industry. It makes a big difference. Yeah. I just had a conversation with one of my neighbors who just sold his $150 million construction business. And he said he had the same team, his border, his lawyer, banker, even the same banker for 25 years, but he had them and that, because I was asking him what was the most instrumental thing. He said, is having that same group the whole time. I can't believe he never changed them in 25 years. That was surprising. So that's great. CPA, everything. So very interesting. Good to know. So let's talk about these contract terms and the lien, our, our subject. When Alex reached out, we were talking about all kinds of things that Alex helps contractors with. And one of the topics we talk about all the time on this podcast is cash flow and getting paid. And, and getting Alex paid, some yes. great topics here and some contract provisions. And just can I just kind of throw it to you, Alex, and we maybe talk about some of these terms? And these sure. Yeah. Provisions. Let's talk about these three terms that I see as really important. And it affects all of the things that we each do for our respective clients. The pay when paid provision, which differs by state. We'll talk about Florida and some other states. Retainage, right? Which is effectively your profit. Wait until the end of the job to get it. How to get it a little sooner. 
And then lien waivers, how to deal with lien waivers. We have had many clients lose lots of money because they signed lien waivers, giving up rights well in advance because they didn't understand the document. So you guys want to break down each one, one by one? Yeah, that'd be great. All right. So at least here in Florida, and I know we're not all in the same state, but at least here in Florida, pay when paid is a perfectly legal term. It has to have certain magic language like condition precedent or contingent upon. But as long as you have that magic language, then if you're a sub on a job, then you are subject to not getting paid if the owner doesn't pay the contractor, which is a big deal, right? I mean, that means that you are shouldering the financial risk of something going wrong on the job. So what do your clients typically do with that? And I know maybe in your states, their pay when paid is not permissible. Well, I think some of my clients, I know they hate dealing with it, but you know, at some point, if you're not getting paid, you have kind of stop work. And that's always a question is, do I have the right to stop work? Can I legally do this. Most contracts don't give you the right to stop work. Most actually say you can't stop work if you're not getting paid. So what we recommend strongly is that clients add a express right to stop work. So it says if I haven't been paid in 30 days, 45 days, 60 days, whatever you can negotiate, that you have the right to stop working. So that even if you don't get paid because you have to deal with the pay when paid provision, you at least can stop the bleeding. You can stop paying payroll. You can stop paying your vendors, delivering materials. So that's absolutely critical as a contract provision. Sometimes people ask me, Alex, look, I've got this 60 page contract. I really want the job. What's the one thing I have to change? Like, just tell me one thing, Alex, that's all I can change. And I tell them it's adding the right to stop work. It's probably the single most important thing you can do because the fastest way to go out of business, and you guys can talk about it from the financial side, is if you have to keep working, paying bills, and you're not getting money coming in the door because you're not getting paid. Is there some language, Alex, in those clauses that will allow the owner or if you're dealing with a construction manager or GC to adjust their prices when you have to get back started if you stop work because you're not getting paid or at that time is this so usually the way the provisions are written is it says that you have the right to stop work if you're not getting paid after a certain period of time but then once you get paid again then you have to go back what we find is that it's pretty hard to get a right to stop work provision added to your contract anyways. It's not a simple thing to do. And usually you'd like to be able to say, if, I'm, if I haven't been paid for 30 days, I get to stop work. Usually the contractor is going to push that to 45, 60. I've even seen 90 days. So to add in other provisions to say what happens when you have to come back to work is usually pretty hard. So we just leave that out. We'll, we'll deal with that when, when we have to. But you know, your question dovetails on another interesting topic which we could probably spend a whole podcast on, which is material price escalation, right? Which is what does it cost to come back to a job if it's been 60, 90, 120 days? That's a whole nother podcast I'm sure we could have on dealing with price escalation. Right. You've had to demobilize from that job site. There's more cost involved. What does happen with the owner? Say I'm like when I had my framing business and the lumber business. So if I had the right to stop the work with the contractor, but how does that go up further? Do you have, it depends on, because there are layers here. So how does, who has the right to even sign that? And when is it even permissible to stop the whole job? Because if I'm a lower tier person, how can you stop the job way up if the GC or the owner, you know, somebody at some level didn't know about that provision, what happens right. then? Right. Well, so most of the time your contract is going to incorporate by reference all of the prime contract terms and conditions, right? So you have these flow down provisions, but what governs is going to be your subcontract or sub subcontract. So I guess, Rob, the direct answer to your question is if it's you, what do you care, right? You're the one that wants to get paid. Okay. So if it stops the well, job, is it that's enforceable? what gets you paid. You know, yeah. Is it enforceable is what I was sort of thinking, I guess, at, at that point. If at somebody least if signed the it, did he have the right it. to sign it? Correct. Yeah. Because don't forget, he's signing, he, the contractor or she's, they're signing for themselves. So they could solve the problem by paying you, even if they haven't been paid. 
right? So they don't have to stop the whole job. They could come out of pocket. Not that they would, but that's really the leverage that you create. Okay. Interesting. That's thinking about this too, from the subcontractor standpoint, a lot of times they're intimidated. They want the job and that GC has got their own provisions and they feel like they can't go and ask for changes in those terms. Yeah, that's a, they would be wrong. (laughs) That's really bad logic, especially in today's environment. They're needed more than ever. Now's the time you should really be tweaking those contracts. Mm -hmm. And then once you start doing it, you can't go back from that. You've kind of started a precedence that that person you're working with is accepted. Yeah, I I agree with that, Stephen. Yeah, that goes really back into an over arching subject that we talk about a lot is what is your ideal client and your ideal job? And then sometimes the best deal you ever do is the deal that you didn't take. So getting into that and not being afraid to not take the job, if you can't get those provisions in there, when you get desperate for a job and that is when things get really kind of scary, you make some bad decisions. I've been there and I have definitely been there, especially when I had a factory to fill up. We didn't have the volume. We had downtime, things like that. You take a lot of not very smart provisions. So it's trying to really focus in on finding the jobs that you can get these contracts in those. And if you can't get these in here, that's not your ideal client. You better go find some more jobs that are your ideal clients that you can get these provisions in there. That's what I would say to that. Yeah. And most subcontractors think that the contractor won't make any changes. Sometimes it's written right on the contract. Do not amend this contract. And your contact point is going to say, oh, no, we don't, we don't amend our contracts. You can't change it. I'm here to tell you that Every contractor, at least in South Florida that we deal with, says that it's written on their contract and all of them will make changes to the contract. All of them. Right. You do what you have to do to do business. And if you're doing business, you got to set some terms that are fair to you. Yeah, very much so. Very much so. And then what I find that our clients find is that the more that they do it, the easier it gets. The hardest contract to amend is the first one. And after that, you realize, wow, this actually isn't so bad. I may not get everything in, but I'm starting to make material changes to the contract. Like, for example, the right to stop work. Or we could talk about the next provision, which is retainage, right? How to get paid sooner. You could talk about that, Stephen. Like, that's all your money, right? Your retainage Mm -hmm. is. So what do you do to get it paid to you sooner? And what we find is you have to make a change to the contract to try to get it paid sooner. It's always going to be contingent on the owner or the lender funding it. You're never going to get it such that you will get paid your retainage when it hasn't been funded upstream, but you got to ask for it. I would think that'd be pretty easy language to add if it's reasonable, just to make sure that you're going to get your retainage in a timely manner when the project's punched out. One of the things we add, if you're the GC, the easy solution, the easy first passes, you want to make sure that there is no retainage held on your fee and general conditions. That's kind of low hanging fruit. So if I'm a GC Mm -hmm. and I'm negotiating a contract with an owner and they're going to hold retainage, I'm going to say, fine, you can hold retainage, but you can't hold it on my fee and you can't hold it on my general conditions. Most owners will agree to that. So that's a great way to get your money. When you're saying fee, what does that mean? So let's say I've got a cost plus contract Maybe it's $10 million and my fee is 7%. So I'm going to bill my 7% fee every month and they're not going to hold retainage on it. So I get my profit with no hold back and I get my general conditions, the dumpster, the fence, all of that stuff. I get all of those paid with no retainage held. I was negotiating a contract yesterday for a GC and that's what we asked for and they agreed, the owner, no problem. Yeah. Well, they should. Yeah. Alex, I think about some of the contractors, like the subs that are earlier in a job, the grading guys and the concrete guys that put stuff in first. And then I've seen them where they've had to wait two or three years to get paid on stuff that, and they were very early on in the contract. And so are there any ways that you can tell people to negotiate those things? What I find is that most seasoned contractors recognize that the grading, foundation, underground contractors, they need their money soon. So even before they negotiate 
with the actual tradesperson, usually they're putting that in as a carve out for early retention release. Again, it's always subject to lender approval. So if there's a lender on the project, it's always going to be subject to the lender approving. But you as the underground contractor, the site work contractor, you want to include a provision in your contract that says that you can get your retainage release once your scope of work is done and then approved by the engineer, architect, authority having jurisdiction. And what we see is that it probably works more than half the time, but what you also get is some holdback. So maybe they're not going to hold 10%. Maybe they'll release 5%. Maybe they'll release 7.5%. But it's better than 10% being held. So on an accounting side, what do you see, Stephen, on that? I guess your clients are probably not happy to have to wait for their money that long, right? Yeah, and there's usually some uh, agreement to reduce retainage clause or provisions we see in the contracts. Retainage is an issue that contractors have mixed feelings on, and it's a lot of money, and it's real. And we talk about cash flow. That's part of cash flow management, managing your retainage. So that's very important to most of our listeners. Yeah, it was so interesting when I got into this business, a lot of the subcontractors, we have higher margins, like this the framing and stuff. We had a higher margin than the GC. And I was told, he said, well, that, that retainage thing, you better just price it, counting on not getting it. And just whatever you get later, it's just a bonus that'll come in. And they don't even track it. I was just shocked. I said, you're kidding. That's a lot of money. And the way they were looking at that and the advice I was getting from these other smaller subs. I was like, you're kidding. You don't track that. You just wait for these checks to come in. Wow. That's just shocking. And the GCs definitely can't do it because that retainage might be their whole profit or more than their right. profit. So it was very interesting when we got into that. And then, yeah, I guess we'll talk about lien waivers in a second too, but yeah, it was a very different world where and, we and were in our part of the country. And I think it had not hit us yet, but that's 20 years ago, I guess, Stephen, they're probably- no, I, I would tell you, no, it's probably not too different. I think I would see that what you said as even applicable here, depending on the size and sophistication of the contractor. So a lot of people don't want to hire a lawyer to review their contract. A lot yep. of folks think that it's too costly, too expensive. I'm not able to change it. So why even uh, bother? And those are all of the roadblocks that contractors want you to believe so that it's easy for them to get you to sign their six, eight, 38 page contract without you even looking at it. When we spoke before, I told you about a story. We have a client, relatively new client, $200 million cabinet company, right? Big company, right? You think they got everything dialed in, $200 million. Before they hired us, they would sign any contract that was given to them. They didn't even check it, review it, modify it. They just assumed that if a contractor gave me a contract, I have to sign it. And we told them, no, actually, you don't. You can make lots of changes. And we've been representing them for almost a year. And they send us every contract and we make lots of modifications. And they get probably a third to half of the modifications inserted into the contract. And if everything goes well, it doesn't even matter. The contract stays in a drawer in someone's file folder on their computer and no one ever looks at it. But if something does go wrong, you now at least have a contract that's fair or more fair so that you can deal with the issues in a more meaningful way than just getting it jammed down your throat. Yeah, Alex, it's frustrating to me. I'm a surety bonding agent. And of course, when someone needs a performance and payment bond, I have to have a copy of the contract. And there's a lot of information that I have to find very quickly in that contract. And they're all different. And there's standard contracts, there's AIA contracts and DocuSign. All of them have addendums and revisions to them. So you have to read it. And I have to read them all the time. And I'm not a lawyer. And I don't pretend to be a lawyer. It's frustrating. But my better clients have also, without us discussing it, sent it to their attorney before they sign it. And just like your attorney, the more educated you are about reading these contracts, the better you can pick out questions, the faster you can read them, the faster your estimators and project managers can scan over them and see what terms and conditions are in this contract that should keep us from bidding it. We shouldn't even waste our time and money bidding it. 
So I want to blow your mind. You ready, Stephen? Yeah. I'm not sure if I mentioned this to you before. So we created a tool that we released a few months ago called Contract Detective. So anyone can go to it. You go to contractdetective.com. You upload your contract up to 100 pages. And within about two minutes, you'll get an email back with your contract with the provisions that we determine are problematic. We've identified 10 hidden conditions, consequential damages, mm -hmm. pay when paid. And your contract will come back to you in an email highlighted with those terms identified. So at least you can find them and then understand them. It'll have a link to a video explaining what those contract provisions are, how they work. So the goal is to try to make it less intimidating, easier for folks to be able to understand their contracts, a more wow. level playing field between the parties. That is fantastic, Alex. That really is. And is that across states? Is that only for Florida contractors? Or do you think, can people anywhere use that? Anybody anywhere can use it. That being said, we are only licensed in Florida. Our focus with this tool is Florida. But that being said, you know, the consequential damage provision is the same in Tennessee as it is in California, as it is in Florida, but it is focused on Florida. We have a lot of people that are using it from other states. Great. That's amazing. So I guess you got so. the AI working on this now. Huh? Correct. Correct. Alex, amazing. tell our listeners again how they can get a hold of this. Just go to contractdetective.com. Okay. You just go well, right there. It'll, it'll take you right there. And you click the button that says scan your contract and you upload it, put your email address in and in about a minute or two, you'll get an email with your contract highlighted and annotated with those provisions identified. So, well, yeah. I've got one right now. I'm getting ready to do a bond for. All right. I, I want to see it. I want to see you submit it, Stephen. <laughs> All right. I can't wait. I can't wait. You got to let us know how that goes. Yeah, we definitely need to put that in the show notes so our listeners can find that. But yeah. I know we're kind of running short on time. We haven't even hit lien waivers. And I know that's one of the topics I deal with all the time from both sides of the GC side and the sub side. Yeah. Look, I'll tell you what I see happen with lien waivers all the time. So it's a couple of things. So one, you sign a contract and it says one of two things. It says you agree to sign any form of release that I give you, but it doesn't have the form attached to the contract. So when you sign a contract that says that, they can hand you a lien release that you're going to object to, but you've agreed to sign it because that's what the contract says. So we strike those provisions and say, no, we're going to use these form releases that are attached and we're going to attach the proposed releases. The second thing is that they attach a release form that you're just going to object to. And the main objection that we see is that one, it is a very broad release. You're releasing any and all rights that you could possibly have before the through date in the release. So if I sign a release for a period through the end of last month, I may be releasing all of my rights, rights to retainage, to change orders that haven't been executed, to claims that I may have, but I haven't yet fully submitted, or even if I have submitted them. So you just have to be careful that you carve out from your release those claims that you have. One of the things that people don't understand is that if I am asked to do a change order in the month of June and I haven't submitted my paperwork yet and I do the work in the month of June and now it's July, I have to submit all of my releases and I sign a release that says I'm releasing all of my lien rights, my rights to claims for change orders, for work in place, everything. But I don't have an approved change order, but I sign that release. I am technically legally giving up my right to that money for the change order that uh -huh. I did that I don't have an approved change order for. So you have to yeah. be very careful. That I would tell you 99 times out of 100, the paperwork kind of just follows on. You'll get paid. The change order will get negotiated and approved and it never becomes an issue. And the only time it does become an issue is when everything goes to hell. The lawyers get involved and they look at these releases and they say, wait a second, you sign this release and you have all this money that's due, we're not going to pay you now because you signed a release that gave up those rights. So you just have to be very cautious. So our advice to clients is you should have a change order log of all of your RCOs or PCOs, and that log should be updated regularly. And that log 
should be the list of exceptions that goes in every release every month. So in June, I may have RCO 6, 12, and 14, and those are going to be the exceptions in my release. That's June, and now it's July, and now I have RCO 12, 14, and 19. Now those are my exceptions to my release. And if you do that, then you never lose any rights because you're always carving them out of every release every month. So how do they put that in there for the guys that haven't been doing that? How I'm mean, actually, I wouldn't be sure exactly how to work that. Do they list it? Do they attach that? Is there a place for that? So people believe that like you have to be really sophisticated and it needs to have an exhibit or you could literally just write it on the release. This release excludes change order six, 12 and 14 period. Sign it, submit it. <laughs> That's it. You're done. It's amazing how it. that stops so many people. It's, oh, God, I just got to get the work done. Just, oh, I know I heard that from Alex told me that. Oh, I'm just signing it. And let's get on with it. Let's get this job done. It's because right. they don't know how to write it. They just don't know. It's something as simple as that. They think it has to be something so formal. Correct. The other thing is making the release conditioned on actually getting paid. That's mm -hmm. a big deal, too. Making sure that when you sign a release and it says that you are going to get $10,000, that it's conditioned on you actually getting the $10,000. Because what happens is, is if I sign a release and it says that I have received the 10000 so I don't have it yet, but the release says that I did get it. And I'm a supplier and I give that release to the electrician because I'm an electrical supply house. And the electrician takes it and hands it to the GC who hands it to the owner. So the releases have gone all the way up and now I'm waiting for the money to start coming back down to me and it never does. Well, wait a second, what do I do? Well, the owner in most states is able to rely on that release that they got, even though you never got the money because they didn't know you didn't get the money because the release that they paid against, don't forget, it's so far up the chain. The release that they paid against said that you got the money. So they have every reason to believe that you got paid. That sounds um, like it can be complicated. So you write that in there somewhere. Conditional. Actually, anything. hold on here. Let me go over here. So we have another tool. We're big on tools here at the Lean Zone. <laughs> so we have this tool called the Make Me Conditional Stamp. A very so, good tool. <laughs> so you stamp it right on the release, and it has the conditional language. So if you don't know that the Lean release is conditional, you stamp it on the release. And then it'll have a little blank right on the stamp and you put $10,000. So if you're expecting $10,000, you stamp it on the little blank, you write $10,000. And now it has all the language to make the release conditional. And anyone can get one for free. They go to makemeconditional.com. There's a little video of how it works. Put in your information. We send it to you in the mail. So yeah. And I don't want to hawk all of my wares here, but we got lots of other things that <laughs> lean we lean wheel, here. baby. Right? We got the calculator. Right? And then the leanomatic, right? So we'll put all of these in the show notes. Everyone, we give it all away for free. This is amazing. That's crazy. So so where can we find them? Our listeners should know that we can go to contractorsuccessforum.com and find this episode, look for your episode in the notes. And we have all kinds of great resources there. And where do we go to find uh, your resources again, Alex? Everything is at theleanzone.com. L-I-E-N, theleanzone.com. There's links there to all of these tools and other. We have free forms that you can download, release forms, contractors, final affidavits, lean, notice to owner forms. So yeah, the links are all there, by the way, to contract detective, to the make me conditional. So if you go to the lean zone.com, you'll get access to everything. Man, Alec Bart, that you are way low down, man. <laughs> great stuff. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. No, no, I'd be happy to do it. And I appreciate you guys having me on your podcast. Um, yeah, we appreciate being on your podcast. That's so right. a duel today. So this is this has been really exciting. This is amazing, all the value that we're getting from this one today. I know this is going to be popular and there'll be discussions. So there are places that you can start and ask questions. And we love to hear from our 
listeners, ask us questions. What are new topics that you may want us to talk about again? What do you want to hear more from Alex about? And you can go to our the resources of where it would be. Right now you can go on LinkedIn, but I think we're trying to work on putting something actually where you can get the resource at contractorsuccessforum.com and find the discussion there. Ask us questions. We'd love to hear from you. We know lots of you guys are listening and I get people coming up to me at parties or funerals or different things and telling me they've been listening, but we want to hear from you. We want to know. So go to contractorsuccessforum.com or theleanzone.com and get that material. We really appreciate having you on Alex. And then we have Wade Carpenter and Stephen Brown, and I'm Rob Williams at the Contractor Success Forum. Thanks for being here today and come back and listen to the Contractor Success Forum. And we'll see you on the next episode.